I want to give you guys a sense of, of our experience in Allentown, Pennsylvania with uh, getting uh, hacker space um, off the ground. Um, really quick, I know IDC gives us like no more than two minutes to talk about our organization. <laughs> I've got to do my little bit real quick. I'll keep the lesson two minutes. So ADC is a 501c3 public-private partnership uh, with the city of Allentown. Um, Sharice mostly explained it. We've been doing what we do for 30 years, including brownfield revitalization, um, downtown development, and uh, business incubation, as well as small business lending. Um, I'm going to do better than Jim. Jim had a picture from 1936. That's 1919. That is the site of uh, the future site of Mac Plant 4A. Uh, Mac Trucks in 1919 moved to Allentown, moved its production facility from Allentown or from Brooklyn to uh, Allentown, PA. Um, they, they built you know, many uh, hundreds of thousands of square feet of industrial space on that site uh, and created jobs in the city of Allentown and sort of cemented. Uh, the, the reputation of the region as a, a manufacturing powerhouse. This might be after 1936. Um, but they built trucks there. Uh, and they built trucks there for a long time, and the region built up around them. Um, then they moved, and they left hundreds of thousands. They moved most of, you know, now they've moved out of the, the region for the most part, but they moved their manufacturing out of the city of Allentown and into suburban industrial parks. And thankfully, they left us their building. So in 1988, uh, 1987 actually, sorry, um, ADC acquired uh, one of their buildings, a 60,000 square foot site, uh, and turned it into a business incubator. And focused that uh, incubation program on manufacturing. Um, they converted a 60,000 square foot building into about 45,000 square feet of rental building area. They spent about $2 million on that site. Um, and uh, have now for you know for over 20 years we've, we've operated a, an incubation program there focused on manufacturing. But uh, and here you can see one of our uh, uh, precision manufacturers. Um, so the focus has been on manufacturing, but you know as every program that, that weathered the late 90s knows, there was also this small matter of the tech bubble that shifted priorities for a lot of incubation programs that weren't very very program focused. Um, we got off track. We spent a lot of our time and effort uh, incubating uh, tech companies. And we had, you know, took 5,000 square foot spaces and dedicated them to a couple of guys in a server who were running a, a harder facility. Um, that left us not in the best place. We, we, we have graduated a lot of great companies. Uh, solar Tech does a, a solar powered uh, construction or uh, highway construction signs. Um, Cold Edge Technologies, which is this thing right here, is a um, manufacturer of closed cycle cryostats for laboratory te test equipment. Um, Zero Truck is presently in the space. They, they uh, manufacture electric drives and for medium and light duty trucks. Um, so the, the manufacturing uh, and focus of the, the innovation program is, is ongoing, um, but we kind of we had to refocus on, on that. And in order to do that, we had to you know, create a, a little bit of vacancy in our building. It, you guys, I'll do a little bit of a question and answer. Um, Jim asked how many people had incubation programs in their uh, regions. How many of you guys have an incubator or incubators that are 100% full all the time? One? Good for you. Um, most people don't have that, that luxury. Most of us have some vacant space like this. Um, we created vacant space intentionally, but we also had some you know, come upon us unintentionally. Um, so at, at the same time that we started refocusing on a, a manufacturing incubation program, um, a couple of other trends were happening. One was September 2008, uh, where everything changed um, for everybody, whether they liked it or not. Um, and that had an impact on us. But it also led to uh, an article that was written in November of 2009 in the Wall Street Journal that I believe the title was Amidst a Crisis, um, a Return to Tinkering. And it was about these hacker spaces. Uh, they talked about um, uh, Third Ward in, in New York, and they talked about a hacker space at uh, MIT. And they talked about a space in Philadelphia called High 76. And I thought that since they were just down the road for, from us, I would just give them a call. And uh, they were incredibly receptive. They were really, really helpful in helping us get our space rolling. Um, and well, let me jump back for a second. 
So the, the kind of path that we felt we took, we reached out to a lot of different institutions in the region, partners that we've had, and, and developed some new partnerships, and created a group of people who had some interest in forming some kind of hackerspace. Um, that included a, a, the Lehigh, or sorry, not Lehigh, we'll get to them in a second, see both back. Um, that, that included a, the Da Vinci Science Center, which is a partnership with Cedar Crest College, which is a women's college in, in Allentown. And uh, they had a guy there who had, he also wanted to start a uh, hackerspace in his science museum. And he was connected to a group of, of guys that were already doing this stuff. They were doing it in their own garage. Um, and we put our heads together and we identified some potential funding sources and submitted an application and sat on our hands for a little bit and got really tired of that. And so then we just started to build. Uh, we had a vacant space in our incubation program, or in our incubator, 3,500 square feet. Wasn't really great for any other purpose, so we just let the guys have it. Uh, we supervised what they were doing. I was always in the space when they were there early on, but uh, we just said, you know, let's build this thing, let's do it. Let's start taking on donations and let's just put the effort in. Um, so I'll leave the hackers for a second and take a really, well, I'm not gonna do it, just quite yet. What, what we did after that is we started doing programming there too. Uh, we built a space, we did a pinhole photography workshop. That's Claudia putting together her pinhole camera. Um, we took some donated projects. This is a do-it-yourself printer. All right, sorry, projector that, um, that is not as good as this one, but uh, but it was pretty darn good. And they made it themselves. And you know, they just did some community stuff. They did a barbecue on uh, Labor Day to just got the hackers together, um, which actually brought these guys are from Norrisbridge of all places, um, and uh, just started hacking the space and getting together on these kind of weekly open hacks where they just hung out and tinkered together. Um, now I'm going to take my detour from. Hacker spaces and talk about co working spaces for a really quick second. At the same time, we were thinking about these collaborative work environments um, known as hacker spaces. We were, uh, were also made aware of co working as a concept. And this was you know, another version of the same kind of thing where you're kind of turning space over inexpensively to creative entrepreneurial individuals and giving them a chance to, to, to really do their own thing. Um, this is a space that we went and checked out in Lancaster, PA. It's called the Candy Factory. Beautiful space. I talked to the people who got the space started and got some insight on how to do a co-working space. So, as our as is the case with us often, we just got to work. Uh, we had a 2,000 square foot space that had no. It's, you know, we're in a manufacturing building, but this space had no garage doors. It had nothing. It was a terrible space to build anything. So we built a co-working space there. Um, and we had a community of people that couldn't wait for us to finish. So they pulled up some desks and chairs and just started working together. Um, I think there, there was a plug for IDC for a second. The, the most recent journal had a story on co-working that I think is pretty good. You can get more detail there. I'll move on. Um, so the big question then is, you can do all this stuff, and you guys can do this stuff, but why do it? Um, and this, I think there's a few reasons for it, but let's start here. This is a quality of life issue now. Um, communities that have hacker spaces are communities where young, where talent wants to be. They don't want to be in communities that don't have these types of resources, whether it's hacker spaces, co-working spaces. This is a, an event that we do uh, on a monthly basis called Developer Friday, where we just invite, the, the co-working space has a, a membership fee associated with it, but one day a month we just invite the entire developer community and to hang out, eat pizza, work together, connect, and build those relationships. And, and that goes a long way toward creating some credibility for us with the entrepreneurial community. Um, it gives us a chance to tap into, uh, I, I, I told Sharice that I wouldn't get too much into the, the STEM thing, because these guys did a pretty good job of it. But, but what I will say is that we, in spaces like this, get a chance to tap into this intergenerational learning. You've got um, Bill Heffern, who's an engineer, a retired engineer, teaching uh, Justin, who is, I think he's a Kutztown student, about soldering, and he's teaching him about putting you know, together these microcontrollers and passing that, that manufacturing knowledge, the, the manufacturing workforce that we have, is a, sort of an untapped resource. And I'm 
promise you that there are people in your community who are dying for opportunities like this to connect with youth, and this is a great way to do it. Um, what else do we got here? Uh, this is uh, this gives this space gives us a chance to connect with uh, groups that are focused on entrepreneurship. So I've got the Lehigh Valley Tech Meetup that I allow to use this space on a regular basis. Um, this is the Lehigh Valley uh, the, the Handmade Alliance. So they they're crafters, but they're selling a lot of stuff on Etsy. Um, this is an early chance for us to connect with entrepreneurs and help them out and make sure that, that they understand we're a resource to them, make sure that they're taking advantage of all of the resources in the region and, uh, and making them feel at home in, in our space. Um, here's where I'll get to Lehigh. You can see we've got the Mountain Hawk there, Bill. Um, this, is a, this is a great way for uh, the Allentown Economic Development Corporation and the, the regional economic development people in the, in the area to connect with college students. This, there's a, a, a ton of folks, and you know, Michael obviously spoke to it with the, the, the students at the uh, University of Wisconsin Platteville, but there are, there are guys doing this in their, their dorm rooms. They're doing, you know, they're, they're programming boards, and they're, they're, they're etching uh, printed circuit boards. They're doing some amazing things, and this is a way for us to reach out to them and you know, give us an opportunity to, to make sure that they feel like they can stay in the region after graduation give us an opportunity to talk to them about entrepreneurship. Um, this is an interesting story down here. Um, this kid uh, called me up. He's a 17-year-old kid from Chicago. He's connected to a hacker space called Pump Station 1 there. Um, he called me up and asked if he could drop in on us. And I said, yeah, of course. You come in and see what we're doing. He came in. He, he showed off a 3D printer that he had built and hung out the whole night. We had an open hack that night. He was there for about three hours. His parents came to pick him up, and I was talking to them afterward, just want to connect with them and see what was going on. They told me that their son was only looking at colleges and communities that had hacker spaces in them. He only wanted, he wanted to make sure that he had some opportunity during his college career to, to be in a hacker space. Um, another reason for doing this is it's not only misfit toys. You know, these guys, it, and this is it's kind of a joke, but the, it's a chance to, to really give a community feeling to some people who really felt like they were alone. I think Michael probably can, can appreciate this with the students that he talked about. What's that? I was one. Yeah, I was. Good. I, I am a maker. Um, these guys were mostly working in their, in their garages or in the basements all by themselves. And they thought, you know, I'm the only guy out there who knows what, you know, Adafruit Industries is. And we flipped the switch on the hacker space and all of a sudden they're finding each other. They're building this really neat community, and that community, we're really hoping, becomes a pipeline into our incubation program. We're hoping that these guys and, and women have a chance to sort of explore their inventions and, and get their creative juices flowing in a place where they also have an opportunity to, to connect with real life entrepreneurs. Um, this is the, the messier state of the, the hacker space today, but you can get a sense of it there. This is. This is actually a clean day for them. But uh, <laughs> you, you'll see our CRT wall back here. Where for some amount of time, we're allowing people to bring CRT monitors in there. If you start a space, do not let anybody bring CRT. It's very expensive to get rid of. Um, but, but interestingly, so, so the building itself has a couple of different client companies. And what, one thing that we've done here is we've given the, the hackers access to those client companies, and they get a chance to really see what real life entrepreneurship looks like. They get a chance to say, okay, this is an idea that I have, and maybe I can commercialize this, and there's other people who are doing that there. But the other thing that's really great for an incubator program is that the incubation clients get to see these guys, and they get to tap into that creativity, and they develop new products. So we have an industrial design company in our space that, you know, he's a, another guy who was, he was taking Martin toasters when he was three years old too. You know, trying to put them back together, but he's he got, he calls himself a maker. He's just an older maker. Um, he came down to the space and talked to these guys and developed a new product idea that he's launching right now. I mean, there's constant flows of creativity into the rest of the program from this space. Um, so, really, well, that's kind of the end. Um, 
I think you saw that, you know, I, when, when, I, when we set this up, it seemed like there was a natural flow of, of bootstrapping. Now looking at the stuff, and Jim's got these beautiful 3D printers, and, <laughs> and, and Michael's got a ton of really good looking equipment, and this is what we have. It's, it's obvious that we're on like a great container. Um, but, but, but that's the thing is that this stuff is kind of, it's like, it's get dirt on your fingernails work, and it, it, it's exciting and fun. Um, uh, oh, oh, real quick on that, the university quick connection. Jim mentioned the NAMI. That's, a, that's something that Lehigh University is involved in. And that additive manufacturing component comes back to the university as well and gives the students there something to, to think about for the future. The, the other thing that they, they thought about is Lehigh has developed a technical entrepreneurship program, a master's in technical entrepreneurship. Um, and they've created a hackerspace on their site now. One thing that you should consider here with, with hackerspaces and with co-working spaces and all of these collaborative spaces is that this is, it's not a, a competitive environment necessarily. The idea is to make sure that it, it's not just a, a thing that you're doing in your space and, and you don't want anybody down the street to do it. The more of these spaces, the, the better. They, they really do, there's a creative properties to develop all these spaces for your regional innovation uh, networks. Um, so really quickly, I'm going to do this. I think Jim mentioned additive manufacturing, and I don't know if everybody has a great definition of additive manufacturing in their head. There's a lot of lingo associated with these spaces. I just thought I'd run through um, a few of these things real quick, just to, to clear up any uh, confusion. That is the famous Arduino. It's a, um, it's a single board microcontroller that's low cost, and it allows you to um, do flexible programming of tasks, to automate tasks, and uh, you, you have to solder it, there's some work involved, but, but it, it's interesting and it's open source, and so you can program these things. This, somebody who's not an electro, uh, electronics expert can program these things to, to do some interesting stuff. Um, I showed you one uh, photo from an event that we did with a, an individual named uh, Mitch Altman, who de developed a device called TV Be Gone. He came to our space, he, he was doing a tour called Hackers on a Train. He came and did an uh, Arduino for Total Newbies and taught everybody how to program an Arduino device called TV Be Gone that will turn off any television. So you program in the code, the, tur the turn off codes for TVs, and go into a Walmart or wherever you want to have fun, or a sports bar where you hate the team, click a button and the TV goes off. Um, so that's the famous Arduino. Um, you guys saw the Shapeways 3D printer, which is beautiful. You saw some very nice uh, um, MakerBot um, uh, thingomatics, I looked like, in, uh, in Michael's space. This is a grittier version. This is a, a homemade 3D printer. You can see the, uh, the PVC pipes back there. That is the act of printing. So Shapeways makes stuff that looks much more big, attractive than this. Um, the the, the do-it-yourself stuff, makes these kind of, you know, it uses ABS, it's a, you'll hear ABS a lot, that's a typically used material in 3D printing. Um, but it's a three-axis printer, so it works like your uh, inkjet printer, but it also builds up. And that's what additive manufacturing is, really kind of layered uh, products. Um, and then real quickly, that, that's a 3D printer. There's three other kind of really, uh, I would say, critical tools that um, you, you'll see in a lot of hacker spaces that you should be aware of. Uh, and uh, consider buying for your hackers. That's a CNC machinery, print, uh, mills and lathes, um, laser cutters, and uh, 3D scanners. And, and 3D scanners are what you you know you take a scan of a person's face. That's actually one of our hackers who scanned his face with a, a he hacked his own 3D scanner, scanned his face, and then printed himself. Um, but you know, so the scanner gives you a, a pixel map that you put into AutoCAD, and, and then you clean it up and print. Um, Printed circuit board, that's a, our hackers are printing their own circuit boards. Sometimes, I, all of you probably have brownfield experience, so you've heard the, the word PCB. When these guys are talking about PCBs, they're not talking about polychlorinated biphenyl ethers, they're talking about printed circuit boards. Don't freak out. Uh, <laughs> Make Magazine is, you know, if the, probably the quickest way to get a hackerspace started is get the local subscriber base of Maine Magazine, get the mailing list, get in touch with all those guys and tell me when I get something happening. All of these guys read Maine. Uh, it's a great addition to your periodicals. I think it costs like 12 bucks a year or something. 
Um, it's good to have in the office, and, and they cover not just projects, but they cover sort of happenings in this world of makers. Um, there's some individuals that you'll probably hear mentioned. Uh, you can see O'Reilly down there. Uh, that's Tim O'Reilly of O'Reilly Media, um, sort of one of the, the leading lights of the maker movement. Another sort of famous name you hear a lot is a woman named Lenore Freed, or Lady Ada of Ada Fruit Industries. She's the famous girl hacker. Um, exciting stuff. Um, here's some more information that you can see from uh, our things. IDC asks you to do lessons learned. Um, <laughs> real quick lessons that we learned from our space um, is you don't have to look like me to get a space started. Uh, you have, what you do have to do is you have to let the hackers guide this thing. It's not about the space. They are doing this stuff in the basement. It's about the community. It's a community development in initiative. It's not a real estate play. It's not any of that other stuff. It's about getting these guys together and, and letting them be creative. Um, so, so that said, there's another book. I, I, I have my copy of Maker, you know, that I was going to wave up here for everybody to read, but I left mine in my bag. But another book that I've been reading, I think it's Jim, so read this. Um, but uh, there's a book that just recently came out called Startup Communities uh, out of Boulder, Colorado. Excellent book by Brad Feld. Um, one of the things that he talks about is, and this is, I think, all sad news for us as economic developers, but he says that economic developers are feeders, they're not leaders in this, in this arena. And that's something that we sort of have to take a back seat to these folks. We have to make sure that they're not you know, destroying the spaces that we have. You, you can take the thousand square feet that you can never fill in your incubator and let them use it, you know, under given certain guidelines. But, uh, but you have to let them run the thing. Um, I think I said don't freak out. <laughs> a lot of people see the word hackers and they think, that they're going to lose all, you know, all of their confidential data on prospects is going to be published to the local newspaper. It's not what they're interested in. What they tend to be interested in is helping you beef up the security system in your building through you know, some simple programming. Or they tend to be interested in stuff that they're working on. But, but most of these guys, the makers, they're not hackers. They're, they're not crackers. They're, they're guys who are interested and women who are interested in making stuff. You know, the, the operating definition of hack you know, or hacker that we use is a hacker is somebody who takes a thing apart and uses it and puts it back together for a different purpose. Um, four really quick things from the co-working movement that's very applicable to this group, and I think each of these guys mentioned it a little bit. Uh, these spaces have to be open, accessible, they have to be about the community, and they have to be collaborative. Um, what we learned is for about a year, we were actively engaged with sort of managing these guys and trying to help them raise money so they could insure themselves so that we could step away and let them run that thing. The minute that they raised enough money to pay for a liability insurance policy uh, for a year, their membership tripled. They, and they started doing, instead of one night a week, they were doing three nights a week and Saturday. They it just exploded, it rocketed. That thing is really important. You have to make these spaces open and accessible to everybody. Um, and I'm going to leave you with this. Um, I think uh, it was interesting, Michael mentioned a 10-year-old girl uh, baking. This is, I think she's eight, and uh, she's soldering a circuit board. Um, she's pretty cute. Um, there's a few reasons I think you need to pay attention to her. And uh, you'll, you'll get more of it when you read the, the bookmakers. But um, there's a kid like this in your town, without a doubt. Um, and I think you, you need to make spaces like this to give them a place to create. Um, this is the, the stem piece a little bit. But the other thing, and, and this opens a bigger conversation that I don't have a ton of answers for yet, but we have to think about as a group, is that she, oops, she's coming for your businesses. She is going to be the creative destruction of the businesses right now that are employing a lot of people. This, the 3D printing movement, and the 3D printing industry is, it's not a job destroyer necessarily, but it's really changing everything for business. Added manufacturing changes the entire equation for manufacturers. Um, it, it, in many ways, it's a good thing. Uh, it, it, but it's gonna force us to, to think a little less about jobs and a little more about 
business entities and how we help those form. Um, it's changing the outsourcing equation significantly. It, it's really changing everything. Um, so with that, I think we're done. I think we're taking questions, correct?